In the first two videos on structural equation models, I've covered some of the sort of conceptual background, the history, some of the key ideas. Um, in this video, we move to uh, understanding some of the uh, applications, some of the actual model fitting that goes on uh, in structural equation modeling. Uh, and this focuses uh, particularly on confirmatory factor analysis. So in this video, I'm going to uh, talk about the, the general idea of how we measure uh, concepts using latent variables. Um, and uh, I'm going to contrast uh, two approaches to using latent variables to measure concepts. The first is uh, the more uh, conventional, historically, uh, the, the, the main way of doing this using exploratory factor analysis. Um, and I'm going to contrast this then with the more modern approach of uh, confirmatory factor analysis. Um, I'll then uh, move on to talking about uh, some of the, uh, the ways that we go about uh, actually fitting and, and estimating uh, confirmatory factor models uh, and some of the, uh, the important uh, procedures that we have to do. Um, and I'm going to finish off by uh, talking about some of the kind of extensions uh, that we can take uh, CFA into, uh, notably when we are uh, modelling the uh, means of latent variables as well as their, uh, their relationships, their associations. Um, I'll talk about the difference between formative and reflective uh, indicators in CFA, um, a procedure called item parceling, um, and also the situation uh, which we may sometimes be interested in of, of, of fitting a factor model to uh, variables which are themselves latent variables uh, rather than to observed variables, which is the usual case, and uh, that would be called a, a higher order uh, factor model. So um, in the first video, I gave a, a, a sort of pithy definition of uh, structural equation modelling as being path analysis with latent variables. Um, we can also think of this as really being a distinction between two stages uh, or, or two parts of the modelling process. The first is where we want to get good measures of our concepts or our constructs. Um, and then the second part is uh, looking at the relationships between those measured constructs. So there's a, a if you like, uh, uh, the emphasis firstly on measurement and measurement accuracy and adequacy uh, and then secondly uh, moving on to look at the, the structural relationships between uh, the constructs that we've measured. So again we saw in the first video um, that any time we want to measure something um, in, in science and particularly in social science um, is that the uh, the measurements contain various kinds of error. Uh, that, that error can be uh, random and or systematic. Um, so what we want to do in our uh, uh, statistical approach to the data is to isolate um, the true score in a variable um, and remove the error. And this is really what we're trying to do uh, using latent variables for, for, for measurement. So we want to uh, decompose our x variables, x is what we've actually measured, um, and we can uh, decompose that into the t and the e components. The t is the, the true score um, and the e is the error. Um, and we, we need some kind of model to enable us to, to split the x into these t and e components. Now one uh, quite straightforward and useful way of doing this is simply to, uh, to add uh, the scores across a number of different x variables. If we have, say, four variables which are all measuring uh, the same underlying concept, then we could just add those up and take a, a, a summed score. Now this has, has some benefits um, because the, the random error in each of those measurements uh, will will cancel out as we uh, add items together. Um, but it's, it's a rather unsophisticated approach and in particular um, it gives equal weight to each item um, in the construction of the, uh, the true score. Um, and that's often something that we, we don't want to do. 
So another approach is to actually estimate some kind of a latent variable model. Now, um, in understanding the ways that we do this in um, SEM, it's useful to sort of go back uh, in history, if you like, and think about a, uh, an earlier approach to estimating latent variables. Now, this isn't to say that exploratory factor analysis is no longer used. Of course it is. Um, but the, uh, the more modern procedure of, of confirmatory factor analysis has some uh, attractive properties, shall we say, compared to uh, EFA. So the exploratory factor model is also referred to as the unrestricted uh, factor model or an unrestricted factor analysis because, as we'll see when we get to looking at CFA, CFA does place restrictions um, on the, uh, the variance covariance matrix, whereas EFA doesn't do this. EFA or uh, principal components analysis is a, a similar technique, um, finds the, the factor loadings which best reproduce the correlations that are observed between the observed variables in our model. So let's say that we have uh, six uh, questionnaire items that all measure more or less the same thing. They're intended to measure some, uh, some concept that we're interested in. Um, a, 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 an EFA will simply kind of reorder the data uh, in a way which uh, has uh, best accounted for the uh, observed correlations between those variables. Now, it does this in a way of producing um, a number of, of factors uh, which are in EFA equal to the number of observed variables that we have. So this is really just a, a reordering of the observed data. Um, we end up with the same number of factors as we have observed variables. So at this point, in just this reordering, um, EFA hasn't done very much in, in way of summarising, of simplifying, which is often uh, what we're trying to do um, uh, with a, a, a latent variable model. So we have the same number of factors as we have observed variables, and all the variables uh, in our model, the observed variables, are allowed to uh, be correlated with all of the factors. Now, we need to get from this point of having the same number of uh, factors as observed variables to retaining a, a smaller number so that we're doing some job of summarising uh, rather than just uh, transforming the uh, observed relationships. And there are different rules for doing this. Um, one kind of heuristic judgment would be to keep or retain um, a, a number of factors which is less than the number of uh, observed variables that explain some satisfactory amount of the observed variance. So we might say we'll retain as many factors uh, as are needed to explain 70% of the uh, variability or the correlations between the observed variables. Um, something else that we have to do, in, a, in addition to, to summarising, is to understand what the, the factors that are produced by the, the factor analysis, what they mean, what are they uh, measuring. Um, now we do this um, by looking at the pattern of factor loadings between the factor and the observed variables. So uh, we do this in a sort of inductive way. We, we work out what the factors are by looking at how they are related to the observed variables. Um, another thing about uh, exploratory factor analysis is that um, there is no unique solution where, where we have more than one factor um, and so uh, we can rotate the axes of our solution um, in ways that can help us to see uh, what the, uh, the underlying structure is and so rotation of uh, axes in, in, in uh, exploratory factor analysis is uh, quite common. Now to give an example of uh, what I mean by uh, some of those previous points, here's some, some made up data um, and we have uh, nine observed items um, and these are if you like knowledge quiz items that have been administered to a, a sample of children. 
and um, what we're measuring is some construct like intelligence or cognitive ability. Now, if we uh, were to apply an EFA or a principal components analysis uh, to this data, um, then we would initially have uh, nine components or factors, which is the same number as uh, the observed uh, items. So the first thing that we would need to do would be to uh, implement some uh, judgment about how many factors to retain. Now, in this case, you can see that four, three factors have been uh, retained in this model, and that may have been based on one of these uh, heuristic guides around amount of variance explained or some kind of uh, plot, like a scree plot. Um, so once we've, we've done that, we want to know what each of these three factors is actually measuring. Um, and we do that by looking at the pattern of correlations, and that's what are uh, in the, uh, the rows and columns of this table, um, between each factor and, each, uh, and, and the set of items. So if we look first at, at, at factor one, we can see that these, the, the, the factor loadings or the correlations are high between factor one and the observed items which are measuring mathematical ability. Um, so this is saying that if you have a high score, the higher your score on factor one, the more likely you are to get the item math one correct. There's a high correlation between your score on the factor and your uh, score on the item. For factor two, there are high loadings on uh, the visual spatial items and low loadings on the uh, other items. And for factor three, we see uh, this other pattern where it's the verbal uh, items that have a, uh, a high score and low scores on the other. So we, we, we do this inductive process of figuring out what the factors are measuring by looking at the correlations between the factors uh, and the observed variables once we've uh, retained uh, a smaller number that we think is in some ways satisfactory. So um, this is a, a very useful procedure and has been widely used uh, in social science for many decades, but it does have some uh, limitations. Um, firstly, EFA is an inductive, it's rather a theoretical procedure, and that is uh, something which in general uh, we uh, are less happy with in terms of the way that we build theory in uh, quantitative social science. So um, we've got a situation where the, the data is telling us what our theory should be, when generally we would prefer to do that the other way round. We would have a theory and test it against the data. Another uh, unattractive property of EFA and similar techniques is that it, it relies on uh, subjective judgment and heuristic rules about what's a, a, a large amount of variability to explain and, and, and so on. So there, there's a lot of room for subjectivity in determining uh, what our uh, model should be. And of course, when we uh, are analysing data of this nature, um, where we have indicators of uh, underlying concepts, it's rarely the case that we have no theory at all about which uh, concepts the different indicators are actually measuring. We've usually written the questionnaire indeed uh, with a specific intention of measuring particular concepts. So actually um, the, the, the more uh, realistic and accurate uh, assessment of what's going on here is that we're starting with a theory and then we're uh, assessing it against the data that we've collected. So the idea that we uh, are going from the data to the theory is not generally an accurate representation of how this procedure actually works. So given that that is the case, given that we, we do have a theory about how the, uh, the indicators are related to the uh, concepts, it's better to be explicit about that from the outset and then use statistical tests of those theories of measurement um, against the, 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 the sample data that we've collected. So we can compare this approach of exploratory factor analysis with a confirmatory approach. Um, so confirmatory factor analysis is also referred to as the restricted factor model because unlike EFA it places uh, restrictions 
on the uh, parameters of the model. Uh, it can't be therefore rotated. Um, you can't rotate the solution, there is only one uh, unique solution for the, the CFA. Um, and the key difference now uh, with uh, CFA to EFA is that uh, we specify our measurement model before uh, we've looked at our data. Um, and this is sometimes referred to as the, the no peaking rule. Um, if we have a theory uh, about how the indicators are uh, related to our concepts, then we should set that down a priori as our theory and then test it against the data rather than tweaking our theory um, as a function of the particular sample data that we happen to have. So when we do things in this way, in a confirmatory way, uh, the key kinds of questions that we have to answer are uh, which indicators measure or cause which or, or are caused by which factors, which indicators measure uh, or are caused by which factors. And importantly, and this is the real distinction with EFA, is which indicators are unrelated to uh, which factors. Remember, in an EFA, we say that uh, every uh, variable is related in some way, is allowed to correlate with uh, every factor. Um, in CFA, that isn't the case. We will say that the correlations or the covariances between some of the indicators and some of the factors is zero. We'll make that uh, as a, uh, a parameter restriction. And we will also need to answer questions about the correlations between uh, the factors rather than leaving that as a default assumption in the model. Here we have six observed variables, x1 to x6. Um, now the first part of the model will have produced uh, six factors or components. So at this stage we've already retained just the two factors that we think uh, explain enough of the, the variability uh, between our observed variables. But what you also see here still is that um, there is a, a single-headed arrow running from each of the, uh, like the two latent variables, eta1 and eta2, to all six of the observed variables. So there is a, uh, we are estimating a correlation uh, between each factor and each of the uh, uh, observed variables. Now what we would be looking for in this kind of situation is that um, some of those loadings would be large and some of them would be close to zero. So if we look at uh, ETA1, for example, we might, in an EFA context, hope that the, uh, or expect that the, the loadings between ETA1 and X1 to X3 would be high, of say 0.7 or above in standardized form, or, and that the loadings that run from ETA1 to X4 to X6 would be close to zero, and the opposite would apply for ETA2. So what we're doing there is, I say, estimating all of those uh, relationships and expecting some pattern of, of, of high and low loadings between them. By way of contrast, the, the same uh, variables uh, and the same two factors now in the form of a confirmatory factor model, now rather than uh, having uh, estimates for all of those uh, relationships between ETA1 and uh, X1 to X6 and ETA2 and X1 to X6, we say that there is no relationship between ETA1 and X4 to X6. There's no uh, arrow pointing from ETA1 to uh, any of those observed variables. And the same for ETA2. There's no uh, arrows pointing at X1 to X3. So the fact that there isn't an arrow there means that in our uh, model, we are constraining those to zero. We're not just estimating them and saying, are they nearly zero? We are specifying our model a priori to say that those paths are indeed zero. So those are the kinds of parameter constraints and parameter restrictions that I was referring to and talking about in video two, that it's quite unusual in other branches of statistics that we use in social science to make these constraints and, and, and fixed parameters to 
uh, particular values. But that's why we call the confirmatory model uh, the restricted factor model because we place restrictions on the loadings. So um, sometimes, as I just uh, gave an example of, we would fix particular parameters to, to zero for indicators that do not measure or do not influence um, a, uh, a measured variable. And the important thing to understand is that our theory of the, the measurement of our concepts, how we think the uh, concepts are related to the indicators that we've uh, selected and, 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 and written if they're a questionnaire item, um, that that theory is expressed in the constraints that we place on the model. So we're not just estimating everything, but we are placing restrictions on what the parameters, uh, the values that the parameters can take. And those uh, restrictions, those fixing of parameters, they over-identify the model. So we are uh, placing restrictions which give us uh, more degrees of freedom in our model, which enable us in turn to test the fit of our model compared to the, uh, the, the matrix that we've actually observed, S, the, the, the sample uh, variance covariance matrix. Another way that we uh, apply um, restrictions uh, to, the, to the parameters in a confirmatory factor model um, is to give the latent variables a metric. Now, what I mean by that is that if we have a, a measured variable, we will have specified some kind of uh, scale uh, for respondents to answer on. So maybe it will be uh, strongly agree is the value one, and strongly disagree is the value five. So the scale uh, is one to five for that measured variable. For a latent variable, um, we don't have any uh, metric. It is a, an unobserved variable. It's a hypothetical variable. So uh, it doesn't have uh, a, a metric um, on its own. We have to give it one. And there are two ways that this can be done. Um, the first is to essentially produce a standardized solution so that all variables are measured in standard deviation units. This can be done by constraining the variance of the latent variable uh, to one. Um, and this has uh, some benefits, but the, the downside, of course, is that we no longer have an unstandardized solution. If we, if we uh, require all latent variables to be measured in standard deviation units, then they don't have any uh, retention of the, uh, uh, the unstandardized metric that they could be uh, uh, given. So the second approach um, is to constrain one of the factor loadings to take the value one. Um, and by doing this, um, we take the, uh, the scale from that particular item, which we'll call the reference item. So if we fix the factor loading uh, of a particular item to one, then that will be the reference item and the latent variable will have the same scale as that item. So if it's measured again on a one to five scale of strongly agree to strongly disagree, then the latent variable will be on a, a scale of one to five. If it's a, a one to 10 scale, the latent variable will be uh, on that same scale. Now, this is generally uh, preferred uh, to the first approach of uh, having a fully standardized solution because we can also get a standardized solution uh, using uh, the, the second approach of fixing one loading to the value one and we also get the, the standardized solution uh, in that approach as well. So um, in confirmatory factor analysis um, we are uh, interested in uh, making good measures of our uh, key constructs, concepts in our theories um, and we are then in this, the next stage usually going to uh, move on and look at the relationships between the, the, the measured concepts. Um, and so conventional SEM is focused on that, the, the structural model, the relationships between concepts. Um, so we are not so interested in the means of the observed or the latent variables. Um, and 
in, as I say, the conventional way of doing SEM, that isn't a focus. The, the focus is on uh, covariances and correlations, relationships between the variables. But there are occasions uh, within uh, a, a, a SEM context where we would be interested in the means of latent variables. Uh, there are two main areas where we would want to estimate latent means. The first is where uh, we want to see uh, whether there are differences between groups on a latent variable. Um, and secondly, uh, if we're interested in change over time, perhaps uh, if we've got a longitudinal data set, we would want to uh, estimate the mean of the latent variable and see whether that is uh, changing over time. So when we introduce means into our uh, CFA, um, then we do this by adding a constant to the model. Actually, um, when you fit models in modern SEM software, um, this isn't a choice that the analyst has to make. It is, if you like, done uh, underneath the hood. But this is the process that is, is actually implemented, uh, is to add uh, a constant which has the value, the same value 1, for all cases uh, in the model. Now, the regression of a, of a variable on a predictor and a constant uh, will give us the mean of that variable uh, in the unstandardized beta of that uh, regression. And the mean of an observed variable um, is the, the total effect of a constant on that variable. So that the, the total effect, um, as we saw in video one, is the sum of the indirect and the direct uh, effects. So if we now introduce a constant, which in uh, path diagrammatic notation is represented as a triangle, and here we have the, the number one inside the triangle to indicate that the constant is one, then we, in this path diagram, have again a y variable and an x variable. Uh, we have a direct effect from the constant uh, to y, which has the coefficient a. We have a direct effect from uh, the constant to x, which is b, and a direct effect from x to y, which is c. So the indirect effect of uh, the constant on y is the product of b and c. So by adding in this constant, we can estimate the mean of x, which is simply the, uh, the, the coefficient b, uh, and we can estimate the mean of y uh, by taking the sum of a and the product of b and c. That's the total effect, the sum of the direct and the indirect effects. So that's how we introduce uh, means into our model. Um, now, if we've added uh, a mean structure in, then we will require some uh, additional uh, identification restrictions because we've, we're now trying to estimate more unknown parameters, that's the, the latent means. Um, so there is a question then about uh, how we uh, estimate and, and compare one mean to another. And the way we do this is by having uh, multiple groups. So where we have uh, more than one group in our sample, then we can fix the, uh, the mean of a latent variable uh, in, in one of those groups to be zero, and then the means of the, uh, the remaining groups on that latent variable are estimated as differences from the reference group. So with uh, mean models in CFA, one of the groups always has to have uh, a restriction to, that their mean value is zero, then the other groups uh, are interpreted in terms of differences uh, from uh, that reference group. When we've looked at path diagrams and thought about uh, the relationship between uh, concepts and indicators between uh, latent variables and observed variables, uh, the arrow will be pointing from the latent variable to the observed indicator. Um, so what this is saying in, in theoretical terms is that the, uh, the latent variable causes the indicators. That's why the, the arrow points in that direction. So we can think of, uh, of that as meaning if we're trying to measure, let's say, uh, someone's um, social capital and we've asked lots of 
questions in, uh, in, a, in a questionnaire uh, that what's actually causing their answers to, to those questions in the questionnaire is their underlying level of social capital. So uh, the causal arrow points from the, uh, the, the latent variable to the observed indicators. Now for many concepts that direction of causality uh, makes sense. Um, in other contexts the, 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 the idea that the causality flows from the latent variable to the indicator um, doesn't really make sense. So let's think of an example where we want to measure socioeconomic status and we're going to use indicators of uh, someone's level of education, what kind of occupation they have, their earnings and so on. And we want to combine these somehow into a latent variable that measures their socioeconomic status. Now, what's problematic about this in the, uh, the, the reflective indicators uh, context is that it doesn't really make sense to say that I have some underlying socioeconomic status and that if that were to change, then my educational level would change or my earnings would change or my occupation would change um, because actually causality is flowing in the other direction if there is any causality uh, going on here at all. So someone's level of education influences their socioeconomic status as do their earnings. So now we're in a situation where the causality uh, makes more sense to flow from the indicator to uh, the latent variable. So the key point here is whether manipulating, uh, if we could somehow uh, change someone's uh, score on the, on the latent variable, would it make sense to change the, the score on the uh, observed indicator? Now, um, for some concepts that makes sense, for others it doesn't. And in the case where it doesn't make sense, we would essentially turn uh, the arrows round and make the arrows point from the indicators to the latent variable. Um, and in this context, we've now got what we call formative indicators rather than reflective indicators. Now, as I said, it's a different sort of uh, latent variable now that we're dealing with. Um, it's essentially a weighted index of the observed indicators um, and it doesn't have uh, a disturbance term. There's no error in it. So it's not uh, the same kind of uh, a, a variable as we would have with a reflective indicator. The key thing is that the, the, in the path diagram, the arrows point from the indicator to the latent variable rather than the other way round. There are, uh, of course, some quite different procedures for estimating this kind of a model, um, but for now uh, the concern is to understand the conceptual difference and the fact that we have the indicators uh, uh, related differently uh, to the uh, latent variables. Another uh, common procedure in confirmatory factor analysis um, is when a researcher may have a very large number of indicators for a latent construct or for a number of latent constructs. Uh, this is quite often the case um, in, um, in psychology where there are quite complex latent variables um, and each one maybe has uh, uh, 10, 12 or more indicators. One of the problems that researchers run into with this kind of data um, is that the model be can become extremely complex very quickly um, and there is lots of uh, difficulties that people can run into with estimation and interpretation and so on. Um, simply because there are so many relationships in the observed data because there are such a large number of, of, of indicators and latent variables. And this is often combined with uh, sometimes quite small sample sizes which can add to this problem. Um, so when uh, in this situation researchers will sometimes use an approach called item parceling um, which is a first stage of taking some scores, adding up the scores for those uh, large numbers of items or for subsets of the subgroups of those items um, and then those, those subgroups of parceled items of, of some scales then act as the, uh, the, the observed indicators for the latent variables. So this is a, a sort of a, uh, a, a 
parsimonious way of treating rather complex data, it does uh, rely on some uh, assumptions about the unidimensionality of the items in that parcel. Uh, but it is uh, an approach that researchers who are in that context of having lots of uh, indicators for their latent variables and large numbers of latent variables uh, can pursue. Lastly, I'm going to talk about uh, a kind of confirmatory factor model uh, where the latent variables are not measured by observed indicators uh, but are themselves measured by latent variables. So we have a, a sort of uh, a hierarchical structure where a first set of uh, latent variables are measured using observed indicators. We have to have observed indicators at some point in the model. But once that, that first set of uh, latent variables are measured, then a higher order factor can be added, which is a function of the, the first stage uh, latent variables. Now, this is an approach which is often uh, useful when our theories are not so much about the, uh, the relationship between variables, but are in the dimensional structure of the data. For example, uh, in psychology there are debates about the, uh, the number of uh, personality dimensions um, and often you know, belief systems and so on. Um, it's important to understand how many different dimensions that there are in addition to how those dimensions might be related to other variables. So um, intelligence, personality and so on, higher order factor models can be uh, useful. They can also be uh, applied in uh, a longitudinal context. So here's what a, a, a path diagram for a confirmatory uh, factor model with a higher order structure would look like. Um, we have at the bottom of the diagram now the uh, observed variables in rectangles. Um, there are nine of those and each uh, set of three is me measuring a, a latent variable um, and then the, the highest level variable eta1 um, is then uh, measured as a function of those three latent variables. So in this third video I've looked at some of the uh, important issues in uh, confirmatory factor analysis, started off by looking at the, the general idea of using latent variables to measure uh, concepts in our theories. Uh, I've contrasted the, uh, the historical approach, the conventional approach of exploratory factor analysis or the unrestricted factor model to the more modern confirmatory factor model, the unrestricted factor model. We've looked at how we uh, can uh, give a, uh, a metric, a scale, to latent variables by fixing uh, one of the indicators to take the value 1 and therefore take the, uh, the scale uh, from that reference item. We've thought about how we can uh, analyse uh, means within a confirmatory factor model. Um, usually we're mainly focused on uh, associations, correlations, but we can also estimate means. Um, we've looked at some special cases uh, where we have uh, formative indicators rather than reflexive indicators, where we have a first stage of item parceling um, when there are many, many indicators and uh, a large number of latent variables. And we finish by the special case of a higher order factor where a latent variable is measured not by uh, observed items but by uh, lower level uh, latent variables.